Hello everyone. In today's command video, we're going to be taking a look at the database. Now the database, in my opinion, is one of the coolest features of command, not only because it's so detailed, sort of like having a Jane's anthology for every military platform the last 80 years, but it also gives you a great way to kind of pick out your missions, plan your operations, determine the strengths and weaknesses of independent units, and everything along those lines. So first things first, there are two main databases inside of command. The first one is going to be the DB3000, which covers pretty much 1980 and up. And then, of course, there's the Cold War database, which is basically 1979 and down. Keep in mind, in the Cold War database, there are some entries that go well before the beginning of the Cold War. Just like in the modern database, there are some entries that have no expiration date. The cool thing about the command people, the good folks who uh, developed this game, is that they're constantly updating these databases based on new information. So both of these actually get updated, and you want to make sure you have the most recent copy, depending on the particular map you're designing. So anyway, the uh, database itself, there are a couple different ways to get to it. Simplest way, if you click on a unit, you can simply click on its entry. Anything that's got this kind of blue hyperlink to it will automatically bring it up. You also can, of course, select that for weapons. And of course, if you prefer, you can go up to game and you can go database viewer. The other option you have for database, believe it or not, for those of you with an internet connection, is you can go on this great website called the Belugan Campaign Wiki, just dial it right into Google, getting all of the database entries in one spot. Like again, I could pick United States, for example, I could get my old standby, the F-16, go ahead and click on it, and it's going to give me the same kind of information I would expect over in the regular database. There's also this newer one called SamanoDB, which is really, really cool. I could do the exact same thing as it just did a second ago and also be able to access this without actually needing to own the game which is kind of a neat little trick if you ask me kind of a thing like that again this is going to have the same style information like this and for those of you who are more power users you can actually open up these database files all these database files are literally stored as sql databases keep in mind they're lock sql databases so you're not going to be able to break in and make changes but i actually did a video on that back in i believe it was june of 2019 somewhere around there showing how you can use r studio of all things in order to open these databases if you want to take a look at them. But honestly, the thing built into the game does a pretty darn good job. So what do we have in the database? We have a collection of aircraft, we have ship, submarines, facilities, satellites, and weapons. Unfortunately, we don't have a sensor section of the database. If you need to get more information about sensors in a particular platform, first of all, if you click on it, it does a pretty decent job of giving you a little bit of information about the generic sensors. But if you need even more in-depth information, I highly recommend checking out the Bluegin Campaign Wiki or cracking that one open yourself. You can actually see coming down here, for example, if I get in the ANAPG 68, I can click on it's going to give me far more detail than I would get in the regular command database for those of you who are power users. Anyway, let's go ahead. I'm going to go basically step by step through all the different pieces, as well as I have a couple little examples down here to kind of show you not oddballs, but things that may be a little less clear. All right, let's check it out. So first of all, we have aircraft. Up here, you can filter by class, which is basically a name search. You have a country, and then of course you can set whether or not it's a hypothetical platform. So for example, if I wanted to do something silly like the A-12 Avenger, you know, go look up what this is you'll notice that this is a hypothetical platform. I could actually say, nope, only give me the stuff that's real. And of course, I'm stuck with the, the naval model of the MiG-29 Psy, but then again, it's still pretty good stuff. Obviously, if the map designer feels the need to give you things like, what is it, the F-14? Oh, what was that funky version? Ah, here it is, the Quick Strike, the E model of the F-14. This is so cool, but um, they would give that to you in that particular scenario. So anyway, we've got... Uh, through that little detail, let's think about this main entry up at the top. First of all, this little number is a database ID number. The way that this program works so quickly and so efficiently is because every single unit in the game has a unique number assigned to it. When you assign this number, you actually link all these other properties to it via this number. This also means people who are developing maps, uh, missions I should say, can use this as a reference number in order to get this unit to come into existence, to delete all units with that unique number, and so on and so forth. Afterwards, you usually get a description of the particular uh, item you're talking about, the name of it. Depending on what country you are, this could be very, very different. For example, in um, the Russian slash Eastern tradition is to always go by the person who built the aircraft. I should say the manufacturer of the aircraft. If you go to the American tradition, generally you get a little letter to tell you what it's used for. If you go to the French tradition, generally you get the name of the aircraft. The description itself is actually secondary. If you want to get a little more interesting, we have the uh, British method of using combinations of letters, in this particular case, fighter ground reconnaissance, that would describe the general gist of that particular fighter. Let's go ahead and get my F-16 again real fast. Next, it's going to give you the 
nickname, and then it's going to give you the country that this fighter is represented by. You're sitting there going, but aren't all F-16s American? Ah, uh, if only it were that simple. As a matter of fact, just going like this, you can see how many different countries and different versions of the F-16 there are. Actually, if you really want to have fun with that, try this one. <laughs> Why are there different versions? Well, if you actually take a look at different countries, different countries will have different loadouts depending on when that aircraft was purchased or if there's any other updates. If you want a very interesting version for those of you guys who are fans of the F-5, you'll actually know this is a special version of the F-5 called the F-5E-3, which is a special Chilean version that actually has more modernized missiles than everything. You even have, if I recall correctly, yep, you have the DAX F-5 as well for those of you guys who want to do Top Gun scenarios. Again, this is just incredible. The next number after the country, of course, is going to be what the year is when it basically saw service. Keep in mind, this might not be the year that it came out of the prototype phase. Some aircraft were significantly delayed. And of course, this is where it starts to get confusing. Let me go grab myself an F-15 real quick. We'll get a C model. Now, you're probably sitting here going, why are there different F-15Cs, all with different unit IDs, even though for the most part, the descriptions actually appear the same. Well, that's because as different years go by, new weapons come into existence. Like, for example, this version of the C of the F-15 has the P-4 model of the Sidewinder. If I grab the 1988 version, you'll notice it has the L model of the Sidewinder. Of course, if I get the 95 version, I would expect to get the, uh, yep, the S model of the Sidewinder missile. If you really want to see how to take this too far, grab yourself an F-18. Ha <laughs> ha! Which version would you like? Or, for those of you who are F-35 fans, try that one out. Look at how many different versions there are going to be. Keep in mind, the reason there's different years is because there's different weapons. The whole idea with that, I believe, was to prevent you from having to basically set each weapons year by year by year, and instead just simply set the aircraft and then change their equipment by year by year. Another way to kind of think about this as well, if you get yourself an AV-8B, for example, let's go ahead and get the 92 model, I think is the one that I like. Yes, it does. You'll notice that 1992, they had the sidearm, which is an anti-radiation missile based on the sidearm winder and you notice if i go to 1995 oh no we still have it at this particular point let's go skip ahead a little bit to 2003 uh da, da, da. yes you'll notice they completely got it out of inventory at that point so again it counts for new weapons and it counts for getting rid of old weapons so that's why there's the different years in the different countries keep in mind different countries might have different capabilities too for example if i grab a j6 which is a classic, you know, it's basically a MiG-19 if you want to think about it. The Chinese version of the MiG-19, cross my fingers, this is good, doesn't even carry any sort of air-to-air -air missiles. Where if I get the North Korean version, assuming I can find it, there it is. Oh, look at how nice that looks. Hmm, paint job time. Scrolling down here, you notice that I am able to carry the PL-2, which is basically kind of a knockoff of that really, really early Russian sidewinder knockoff if you want to think about it. It's a knockoff of a knockoff. <laughs> so anyway, that's basically why that's like that. Okay, so that takes care of the details up at this line. Scrolling down here, sometimes you get a picture. Again, if I go back to F-15C real quick, a lot of times you're going to get yourself a nice little, almost like a Wikipedia. If, as a matter of fact, I think that's where that came from. Uh, entry on this particular aircraft. If there's a um, picture that goes along with it, generally this is going to go up at the tippy top as well. So that's enough of that. I think you guys have the idea. Scrolling down to general data. So first of all, you're going to find out what type of category this aircraft is. We have a different kinds of categories. We have fixed wing. We have carrier-based fixed wing. Of course, we have rotary wing as well. And if you really want something interesting, we have aerostats as well. Whoop, too bad we don't have zeppelins. That'd be kind of fun. You have aerostatus type as well. This is literally a balloon. <laughs> it's just kind of neat. After that, you're going to get your general, again, good old-fashioned description. You're going to have its general size. Keep in mind, size does not equal radar signature. It's just size. You have a little rating down here for crew. Let's go and get my F-16 real quick. Let's get a D model this time. You'll notice that this is a crew of two. This has no impact unless you're designing a mission where you could have people who got shot down and they automatically get ejected. This is a great reference you can use. You have an empty weight. You have a max weight, a max payload. Of course, you could do the math real quickly to work that all out very, very quickly. You have the UDA cycle, something we've talked about before. Basically, this is how fast the unit can get off a shot based on detection of an enemy. Of course, you have a thing for evasion as well. How long does it take to evade? Over on this size, this is general aircraft size. I also kind of think of this as aircraft bulkiness. This is going to be physically how large it is. This is how the game is going to treat it as far as being in the ground or in a hangar or basically sitting on the deck of an aircraft carrier. So, for example, if we've got a Sukhoi 33, let's go grab this one. You'll notice that, oh, by the way, carrier capable. You'll notice that the size is a large aircraft. And again, that will impact how many of these you can pack onto a carrier. 
Under that, you typically have a rating called agility. This is a relative rating of how long you can hold a sustained turn and how tight of a sustained turn. We'll actually look at this in just a minute. Next, you get average climb rate. This is a great way to have a relative scale of how quickly an aircraft can do a sustained climb. So if I ordered this aircraft to go from zero feet to 36,000 feet, this is going to be able to allow me to have a rough estimate of how long it's going to take. Keep in mind, as you go higher, the air gets thinner. This average climb rate decreases. Instantaneous climb rate is a little different. This is basically, I'm up to speed already and I need to get up in a hurry. I'm willing to trade energy in order to get a little bit of altitude to maybe get that Dutch missile off, for example. This is not something you can sustain, but it gives you a great idea of the performance of the aircraft. Down here, of course, we have takeoff and landing distance. This is related to the size of your airport. For example, you look at my airport here, it has a 3201 to 4000 meter runway. That means I have no problem launching and landing this aircraft at that airfield. Keep in mind, every once in a while, you'll see something like this. Da, 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 da. Zero. It simply means it can take off and land. Now, I know people who are experts in the Harry would tell you you can't actually take off in zero distance at max load. We don't care. <laughs> Again, some of this is abstracted for your convenience. Underneath that, you have what they call cockpit visibility, which basically tells you how easy it is to spot targets visually. Obviously, if you're looking out the front window, it's easy to see on a hang Harrier. Uh, having experienced a Harrier in VR before, I can tell you it's like sitting in a giant bubble. It's like sitting on top of like a telephone pole. It's not quite F-16 visibility, but it's pretty good. Sideways visibility is left and right. Of course, aft is directly over your tail. Now, if you do something silly, like let's go get something that we know you can't see behind, let's get a MiG-21 BIS, you'll notice that its aft visibility is out pretty poor. If we go grab something, let's go get an F-16C again. I think this might have decent average. Yeah, that's what I expected. It's a great bubble canopy, so it's easy to see. Underneath that, you're going to have your armor. Keep in mind, this armor is basically non-existent with the exception of a couple aircraft inside the database. My favorite example of this, of course, the A-10. If you were to click on this one, you'd actually see that there is some armor. It simply means that weapons that are going to attack it are going to have their damage reduced significantly. There's not a lot of weapons in the game that are assault rifle in size, so you're not going to have to worry about this. Most of the stuff that's going to be shooting up at your aircraft is going to be bigger than 20 millimeters, so this is actually not going to help you too much, but keep in mind it does help you. Below this is damage points. Keep in mind most guns do about one damage, but also keep in mind that individual components can be damaged in command. So just because I have five damage doesn't mean my engines have five damage, even though they are armored. So that's the general gist of this stuff up here. Scrolling down here, you're going to have your sensors in EW. Generally, it's going to be radar first, eyeball last. That's kind of a general rule. Obviously, when we get to ships, this is going to be different. General descriptions of sensors are provided. Keep in mind, if you try to use the sensor beyond its max range, it's not going to pick up anything. And you'll see this, especially when we look at ships later. It'll tell you what it's for, and it'll, of course, it'll give you a general generation. Generally, the newer the technology, the better it is at detecting older technology, or detecting older targets, or targets that have larger signatures. Obviously, this is an ALR-69, it's a radar warning receiver. This doesn't mean it's a surface search radar. Coming down here, you have the paid penny, which is a great system for spotting laser targets. And of course, you have every, almost every unit in the game is going to have some version of the Mark I eyeball. Keep in mind, just because it has a 50 nautical mile range, doesn't mean the pilot can see 50 nautical mile range. He's going to be limited by this stuff, plus the regular atmospheric visibility conditions. Scrolling under that, you're going to get mounts, stores, and weapons. This is basically what I carry by default and what am I capable of holding, which is going to be this stuff down here. So you guys know the A-10 carries a 30 millimeter GAU-8. It is an amazing cannon, and it goes ahead and gives you a description of what it can attack. It's a range. It tells you if it's local control. Of course, you also have some uh, chaff and flare here if you need it. This is always on the plane no matter what. Scrolling down here, these are all the possible weapons that this aircraft can carry. We don't have direct control over what the aircraft can carry. We basically get to pick from a menu of loadouts that are going to be a combination of these weapons in order to be successful. Speaking of loadouts, once you scroll down a little bit more, you get the individual loadouts themselves. But keep in mind, usually at the top, you're going to have the ferry loadout, which is basically designed to go as far as you possibly can. It's going to give you the range. Believe it or not, an A-10 can travel 2,500 miles on its own. That's incredible. Keep in mind, you're only carrying two extra fuel tanks to do so. That's going to tell you how long it takes to get ready. It's going to tell you day-night weather. It's going to tell you its pre-beef weapon state. Again, go look at the WRA video if you're looking for a little more details here. You've got all the different possibilities. Keep in mind, just because it's on this chart does not mean you can necessarily use it, especially if it's nuclear, or if the scenario designer has chosen to basically limit your ability to carry certain weapons. Obviously, an A-10 has a lot of selection because it is an air-to-ground aircraft. If you pick something a little bit simpler, Let's grab the Hunter UAV. You'll notice it literally carries basically nothing except for the bat, which is kind of fun.
And again, very, very, very simple stuff. Coming down below, you go with the call the comms and the data links. Basically, this is all communications. For those of you guys who have communications disruption turned on, if these get destroyed, they lose their ability to communicate. Let's actually, we'll look at this when we look at ships. Sometimes as well, you'll see these things called data links, and that's basically their ability to communicate with certain types of weapons. The popular one you're gonna see is the Link 16 system, where basically with that, you can actually get information back to the launching platform, which is really, really cool, like your tactical tomahawks. Underneath here, you have your signatures. There's a couple different types of signatures. We'll look at this one. We'll look at ships and submarines again in a minute. Basically, a visual detection range. Again, if I can't see through a cloud, it doesn't matter what this number is. We have classification range. Generally, you have to get close to a target to classify it. And A-10 is kind of a unique example. It's pretty distinctive. So it's, again, not going to have the longest classification range. This is going to be the detection range. Again, this is from front, side, and rear. And of course, you have the infrared classification range, which I'm pretty impressed that you can identify something exactly by its infrared. Something to notice here, though, is infrared detection range. Look at how high it is from the back, because that's where all the heat from the engines are going to be coming. Down here, you're going to get a rating of, of course, the different radar signatures. Now, this little UAV here is small. As a matter of fact, it is 0 0.0049 square meters area. Keep in mind, that isn't how big this thing is. That's how hard it is to detect. There's a difference. Your radar signature doesn't necessarily equal your physical size. Now, my favorite example of this, let's go get ourselves a B-2 bomber. Da, 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 there we go. It looks pretty good. Notice its wingspan is 52 meters. And notice its radar signature is 0 0.00015 square meters. Now, that's what I call stealthy. Now, keep in mind, too, it's very visible. It's a B-2. What would you expect? But at the same time, as you'll notice that our radar is set into two different bands. You have basically long wavelengths and you have short wavelengths. Another way to think about it is these are your search radars. These are your fire control radars. Now, a B-2 bomber was optimized to have a better time against the search radars, as you can see, because it's a smaller signature. I'm sorry, the attack radars than it was the search radars. As a matter of fact, you can pick up a B-2 bomber on an ancient radar system because of the fact that it's going to be more sensitive in that particular area. Obviously, if you grab something like, let's get an R-35A real fast, you'll notice that it is a little bit easier to detect from a search radar's perspective than it is a fire control radar's as well, even though it's a smaller target. By the way, talking back what I was saying about the Link 16, there it is. By the way, you're going to see this thing that says channels. If you have more weapons in the air controlled by this unit than you have channels, you're not able to control all the weapons at one time. Underneath there, you're going to have what they call properties. Now, properties are interesting. And to me, I've talked about these before. Basically, they're going to tell you, is there an agility modifier? Is there going to be a modifier that lets them fly lower to the ground? Do they have special bombing systems? Obviously, helmet-mounted sight means that you can engage targets off, basically off-bore, which is incredible if you've ever seen some of those weapons in action. It'll even tell you with the refueling capability. Underneath there, you're going to have propulsion. Obviously, if I do something like, let's get a B-52H real quick. You'll notice that it tells you how many you have, plus what they're called. It tells you a general type. You've got to be careful with this general type. I'll show you why. Whoops. Hey, the only aircraft I have a significant amount of time actually at the wheel of. No, 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 no. If I can get it to work. There we go. Ah, piston. Okay, so it did work that time. Never mind then. So keep in mind, sometimes this will say something other than what you expect it to. But anyway, it tells you how many engines you have. If you have different kinds of engines that will be represented here. This is going to be important when we look at ships. Of course, it gives you your max speed, things along those lines. Under technical details, let's go get our F-35 again real quick, the Canadian version. It will give you how much thrust you get at sea level. Your afterburner thrust. It will also give you your fuel consumption for those of you guys who are so inclined. If you really, really want to work out this calculation yourself, what you could do is you could calculate how much thrust you need. Let's say one nine five two two. Then you multiply it by this little number here, which will give you how many kilograms of fuel per hour you would get at that particular burn. You, of course, if you scroll down real quickly, you'll realize that our F thirty five only carries eighty three seventy five. 75 out of 16, 788 means you only get about a half an hour worth of fuel at full afterburner at zero altitude. Now, this is actually broken down even better for you using this performance detail chart. You can see, for example, if I'm at an altitude of 24 to 36,000 feet, this is how much fuel I burn per minute. This is what speed I'm going to be getting. Naturally, aircraft that are high performance are going to be going faster at higher altitudes, and they're also going to be burning significantly less fuel at those altitudes. Some aircraft like an F-35 can actually supercruise, which is even cool. Cooler. And uh, you'll see that represented in this here. Keep in mind, anything between these values is always going to be lerped. Generally, as far as jets go, the lower altitude you're traveling, the worse your fuel economy, the lower your top speed. At the very, 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 very bottom, you're going to have whatever kind of fuel this ship carries or aircraft carries, plus its weight. 
that's it for aircraft. Not too, too complicated. Keep in mind, if you're not sure about anything, you can always just click on it to get some more details. So for example, if I click on the AIM-120, you'll get this detail, but we'll go into that in a minute. All right, let's look at ships. Now I'm going to grab myself a, a Garcia frigate here. I wanted something complicated without being too complicated. Ships are going to be following the same basic format with some extra bonuses. First of all, you're going to get the general category. You're going to get the type. Again, every different country has a different way of classifying. One of my favorite examples of this is the Russians like to have these things called aviation cruisers. It's not really an American concept. It was basically an excuse to have aircraft carriers in the Black Sea. We have how many damage points. Obviously, for ships, this tends to be a big number. We have its general sizes. Notice there's no value for height. Coming down here, we have our empty displacement. This is, again, not too, too critical for us. By the way, with aircraft, our um, maximum weight versus our current weight does matter because it impacts our agility. Coming down here, you can have crew, you have the UDA cycle, and you have this new value called missile defense. This is simply a rating of how well this particular ship is at defending itself against incoming missile attacks. Generally, if this number is greater than one, it simply means that it has some capability to engage incoming missiles. Now, if we were actually scroll down a little bit, we have these five inch guns here, yep, which would have the ability to engage incoming missiles. And if I recall correctly, nope, not in this particular aircraft, or, or ship, I should say, but it does have the ability to sort of kind of engage them with this particular weapon. Not going to go well, obviously. Generally, this is a pretty accurate number for ships. It can be less accurate depending, of course, how advanced this missile is. This is assuming a harpoon, which is not exactly the most sophisticated or highly damaging anti-ship missile. Coming up here, of course, we have all our details as far as armors goes. If you really want to really want to look at some armors, you're going to have to get yourself something in the battleship class. Generally, this is just going to resist incoming damage, and you can see from looking at these numbers that this battleship is going to take a lot of pepper to bring down compared to something uh, we can go get. Let's go get a big one. We'll get the Belknap. Why not? Notice, no armor. Basically, we got away from armor once that World War II was over because of those silly anti-ship missiles. Afterwards, you're going to get your sensors and electronic warfare. And again, take a look real quickly. Notice you have your general radars up at the top, generally fire control, and generally you have eyeballs some here down here. Sometimes when they tack on new stuff, they'll put it down here. You're going to get all the information as far as what it can search for. It's going to provide range information, altitude information. You're going to get details about what operational band it operates on. Now, if you remember, when we saw a minute ago with signatures, this is a C-band radar, which means it would have an easier time seeing the B-2 than this radar, which happens to be a G-band radar. And again, that's generally why you see that. Keep in mind, you're going to be getting details like 3D long range. You're going to have a little general piece here. If you need more details, you're going to have to go back to the Belugan campaign wiki and track down the actual detail that you need for that particular unit. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Again, it's pretty straightforward as far as aircraft. Down here, you have mount stores and weapons. Keep in mind for ships, generally you have several different mounts that are built into the ship. You're not really going to be, you know, trading out your main mission packages. That's going to go by version. But what you will see, just kind of scooting down here very quickly, is you're going to see the different weapons. It's going to go ahead and tell you how they can be directed. Keep in mind, most ships have what they call director control towers, which can aim the guns for you. And again, that'll be represented over here. Local control simply means if we've lost our ability to use the central fire control we can just grab the gun by hand and just do it that way which is actually kind of neat if you ask me but i wouldn't trust my aim against a 700 mile an hour target i don't know about you keep in mind you're going to see this little item here where you're going to have one number that's in white and usually two or three numbers in blue that simply means this is the default sometimes uh, users choose to go ahead and add these particular items onto the ship as the standard this becomes really important with torpedoes and submarines as we'll see in a minute Scrolling down here, of course, you get your magazines. Your magazines and ships can also include magazines for helicopters and aircraft, depending on what type of uh, carrier or something along those lines it is. Generally, this is going to let you know what it's got kind of backup that, of course, it can go in here and feed into these guns a little later on. You have your communications and data links, just like you have with aircraft, only there tend to be more of them and more different kinds of them. We have aircraft facilities. You're not going to find an aircraft with an aircraft facility. I don't think we have flying carriers. I don't think we have TB3s either. Either. So I don't think that's something we really need to worry about. But in general, it's going to tell you the size of the aircraft that can accommodate. Of course, it's going to tell you it can park one as well as have one in the pad. In this case, we can actually carry two small helicopters. You're going to have your signatures, but this time we have a brand new signature, and that's going to be our sonar signature. We have all these different bands of sonar sound. So for example, to very low frequency, which is 0 to 1,000 hertz, think of this as your bass boost for those of you guys with the stereo. It's going to be extremely loud which is not a surprise given the way that you have to 
turn a propeller in order to make you go in the ocean. Keep in mind, 125 decibels is a pretty big number. It's going to be detectable by pretty serious distance. Also notice that this particular frequency radiates outwards because it's just about equal on all sides of the ship. Looking down here, we have our medium frequency sonar. You can see, depending on what side of the ship, it changes. And obviously, high frequency sonar is not going to be as loud because it tends to be attenuated very, very, very quickly. As a matter of fact, the human ear would have a heck of a hard time listening to anything with that frequency that high. Mind you that torpedoes tend to operate on different frequencies. Finally, you get this funky one called active sonar. This means somebody is pinging you, and this is the response. You'll notice from the front of the ship, that is not much of a response at all. From the side of the ship, look at how loud that ship is, which should mean anybody with active sonar ever could pick this thing up from an absurd distance from the side, but not so much from the front to the back. We have a visual detection classification, infrared detection classification, and of course, as usual, we have our radar detection. Now, there's not many ships that have the ability, I believe we're going to try to find this one real quickly. I'm just going to type in 1000 and see what I get. Ah, this is a zoom vault. I believe this is the only one I can think of off the top of my Yeah, take a look. You'll notice that for our control radars, look at how tiny a signature is from the front. For a ship, this is staggering, that's this large. That is pretty cool. It's like a stealth ship, but not really. Scrolling down here, of course, you get your regular properties. Again, every different ship's a little different. Generally, you get things that will tell you things like you have a degauss steel hull, which simply means that a magnetic mine isn't going to notice you. It can tell you where you can get fuel, and of course, it can tell you where you can get ammunition on the thing. Down here, you're going to get your propulsion type. In this case, we have a couple MT-30s. Obviously, if you lose one, you can still go in the other. You're just not going to be able to achieve top speed. The performance details are basically the same as aircraft, except that, fortunately, there's only one altitude that ships operate in, and you're going to see these down here. Of course, a lot of times you'll see aviation, fuel if you can carry a separate helicopter. Now something you want to watch out for that's a little different to looking up here in case you miss this. You've got this max sea state. This basically says if the ocean is bumpier than this then it's not possible to do operations with this particular ship. In the real world it would mean that you couldn't, you basically have to come to, you basically put the ship at a very very slow crawl, you couldn't have anybody walking around on the deck, they'd probably get ejected, your weapons would probably be soaked and you'd be very very have basically a really tough time operating the ship. You have a troop capacity, a cargo capacity, and this little detail real quickly, which tells you how big of a dock you're going to need in order to accommodate this particular vessel. And again, you have the regular armor and things that you probably saw before. Now, if you get something a little different, let's go ahead and get the Nimitz, for example. You'll notice that its magazine is loaded with good stuff, basically to support a typical carrier air wing of 1994. You know, your F-14s, your F-18s, your A-7s, your A-6s, stuff along those lines. This, of course, can be modified. All right, so that's about it for ships. Let's go ahead and take a look at submarines. Hey, we're halfway there, right? So submarines are a little different. I'm going to go ahead and close this. So what I've done is I've gone and get myself three submarines. By the way, if you're ever curious, if you zoom in on the map, the size of the unit is actually represented against other ship sizes in its group. So anyway, we have a submarine. We have the Dallas. We have this Kilo class, and of course, we have a Type 209 over on this side. You're probably saying, why did you pick these? Well, if you take a look over here, do you see it? All right, let's take a look at a submarine entry. On submarines, you basically have the same information. Again, different types of submarine. You have the damage points. Keep in mind, if you're submerged, these damage points become less effective because uh, crush Scrolling down here, you have your displacement crew, OODA loop, uh, we have our evasion. Now we have a max depth. Unfortunately, in command, we cannot send a submarine deeper than its max depth. Kind of a bummer. Keep in mind, this is also limited by how deep the ocean is where you are. Obviously, we're at 10,000 feet here. 3,000 meters is about 1,000 feet. We'd have no problem going all the way down. You have the pier size, and you have this little ROV operating radius for those of you who use UUVs. Scrolling down here, same sort of information you get on ships. Of course, they tend to be tailored to being underwater. Again, you have radars. Not that I recommend using them on a submarine. That seems a little silly. You have towed sonars. You have special octave uh, sonars going down here. Sometimes you have periscope. Ah, this is it. Notice you have this new version called a periscope, which basically is all the cool technology that your periscope is capable of doing. You're probably wondering why this is a weird distance. That's because of the curvature of the Earth, for those of you who are curious about that little detail. And obviously, we have all this information. Keep in mind, a submarine has to be at periscope depth to automatically use any of these sensors. And obviously, mark one eyeball, but that's only good if you're surfaced. 
Scrolling down here, we have our usual mounts and stores. Keep in mind, submarines are a little trickier because they tend to have less tubes to launch stuff from, so their default stuff may actually be different. So, for example, if I came up here and click mounts and weapons, you'll notice my Mark 67 torpedo tube has got this nice little, uh, what do we got here, Mark 48 ready to go in it. If we wanted to switch this to one of these tomahawks, I'd have to actually click it and then tell it reload priority, and now it would go ahead and swap that particular one out. But anyway, going back to the details here, we have our magazines in the event that we have anything that we need to eject. We, of course, have the magazines that are on board. Keep in mind, we have some Tomahawks. If we didn't want to use this version, we, as the scenario designers, would have to delete those and then add in the version we did want to add. Last but not least, you have your communications and data links. A lot of modern submarines have this little tricky one called a torpedo wire control. Basically, I can launch a torpedo, and then using a wire, just like a tow missile, I can actually steer it around as long as this data link is still intact. Of course, you've got your radios. Ship submarines are a little tricky because, of course, if they're at low depths, they will not be able to communicate with the ground. Yeah, yeah basically. If this operation right here, realistic submarine communications, is turned on. So kind of keep that in the back of your head as well. Obviously, if that's not the case, you can talk to your subs at any time. You have, of course, your UHF, you have UH radio, you have all your signatures down here. Notice very low frequency here is a lot quieter than the ship because, again, it's a nuclear sub. Scrolling down here, of course, you can see these things are super duper quiet, especially from the front. But if you can ping this submarine on the side, look at that rating for um, noise. That's incredible. Detection range is only relevant if you're on the surface, although it does simulate shadowing. So if you're in very, very calm seas and it's bright outside, you can actually see a shallow depth submarine from above visually, which is a really neat trick. Scooting down here, of course, you've got your radar signatures. Um, your submarine shouldn't be radar signaturing. Then you have your properties, which are very similar to those of the ship. And of course, you have your propulsion. In this case, we have an S6G nuclear reactor. It's nuclear, 32 knots. Notice there's nothing about fuel. But what there is, and this is a submarine issue, is it gives you different bands like you have with aircraft. However, you'll notice the speeds are going to be different depending on how deep you are. Generally, with subs, if you go deeper, you can go faster. Of course, this changes if you're diesel, which is why we're going to go take a look at a diesel sub. Clicking on our good old-fashioned kilo here. Scrolling down to the bottom, this stuff's all pretty much the same. You'll notice that we have two separate ratings here. We have one for the electric motor. We have one for the diesels. Keep in mind, if you are a diesel-powered submarine, you have to have a snorkel, which is listed right here, or you have to be on the surface in order to use your diesels. Basically, if I'm using my electric motors because I'm too deep to use my diesels, these are going to be the different speeds I get at the certain depths at the fuel consumption. Of course, at the very bottom, instead of giving you a number for battery, they give you this annoying thing where it says how many hours you get at creep throttle. If you needed to actually calculate how much battery time you'd have at, say, full throttle, you'd have to do something kind of like this. You'd have to take whatever the creep throttle is, multiply it by how many hours you get on it, and then divide that by how much this particular one uses. So you see, I get 5.3 hours at full throttle and 11 knots at that particular depth. Actually, look at this. Uh, performance details. Da, 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 da. Look at that. 85 battery units per minute. Wow. What depth is that? Okay. That's a fast sub. Not bad. And of course, you have performance details for diesels. Keep in mind, once you bring your diesels up to a certain speed, you're assumed to not be charging your batteries. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And of course, you have your diesel fuel as well as your battery power at the bottom. Now, let's get more confusing, shall we? This particular submarine has AIP, which is Air Independent Propulsion. It's a special motor that basically gives you really, really nice power without running the uh, electric motors and without running the diesels. Think of it as like an improved, I guess, I'm trying to think about it, like a better battery almost. But of course, once you run out of it, that's it. That's game. You just tend to have a lot of it, which is kind of nice. This is going to be the exact same as the other two submarines. The only difference being, of course, is you have three different ratings here. You have to tell the submarine, by the way, to use air independent propulsion in order to do any of the stuff down here. If you were to go to its doctrine window, of course, you could go ahead and define that right down here whether or not you wanted it to be using it but again all the other details on the submarine are the same and of course you can see you have all the units and stuff along those lines over here on the right but that's pretty much it for submarines now let's get to facilities uh oh facilities Facility is a catch-all term for ground units. Basically, anything on the land is considered a facility, which includes things like a little building, you know, some artillery, maybe a radar, maybe a SAM site. We have an underground bunker. We have this little airfield over here. Basically, those are all considered to be facilities. Unfortunately for us, they have different properties depending on what they do. Let's take a look real quick. For example, our single unit airfield here, you can see it has the size. It tells us how many damage points. Wow. 
it also tells us its size. It tells us the total area. It tells us uh, what its OODA loop is. It's going to give a missile defense. By the way, single unit airfields cannot be attacked by anything except nuclear weapons. You're also going to notice scrolling down here what its armor is going to be. You're going to see if it has a magazine. I didn't give it a magazine, so this is just generic munitions. And of course, we have all the different aircraft facilities here. Now, if we did something like uh, scoot over here to a medium building, Again, your details are going to be pretty much the same. It's going to tell you what it is, how healthy it is, how big it is. It's going to give you a general area. It's OODA loop. It's going to have a missile defense value. This is kind of interesting because why would a medium building with no defense have a missile defense value? This is going to be roughly how many missiles it takes to destroy. Scooting up here, you have a general idea of armor. Again, this is a medium building. I assume probably stone construction or something along those lines because it's relatively strong. You have a mass site and a dispersal radius, which will be important. Coming down here, you have all the usual signatures that you're quite familiar with at this point. Let's get a little more complicated. Let's get something like a 155 millimeter howitzer. Now, this time you're going to notice the categories change to mobile vehicle. The other thing you're going to notice is it has no size. You're probably sitting there going, well, that's strange because I can clearly see something here. It's got to have something. It's a little different when it comes to artillery. Basically, what you have is you have a unit that's made up of several smaller units that are 80 meters apart from each other. Each one of these units can actually be attacked, not individually, but they're attacked together, but they basically get destroyed independently of each other, depending on the type of weapons that you're using against it. So in this particular case, because it's such a wide dispersal radius, that um, again, if you had a weapon that only did 40 meters radius, it would not actually hit hit every one of these weapons each time it hit. Of course, if you're using something like a CBU, this is a very, very different story as far as that goes. Again, the reason this missile defense is prevalent here is because it takes more than one missile to hit all of the vehicles in that thing. Down here, you can have sensors in EW. You can have the regular weapons as well as signatures. Let's try a complicated one, radars. First of all, if you were to click on mounts of weapons, you see there's nothing here because it is a single unit. Now, if I click out on the database entry, you get a nice picture. And of course, you get all the details you saw before. Now we have this funky value called mass height. Mast height refers to how high off the ground the SAM's radar is. Now you'll notice on ships it's something we really need so you can know how far you can see over the horizon because otherwise it's assumed to be zero. They actually estimate it based on size in case you're curious. But this gives you a finite value if you want to calculate radar horizon. Notice we have a length and a width because we're only a single unit this time. We have our usual OODA loop and everything like that as well as our sensors need DOW and your band. Notice this one has a two missile defense even though it's a single vehicle. Use your judgment, people. Don't fire two of something at it unless you have to. Don't waste those harms. By the way, some later radars will have like eight for that value, even though they have no way of defending themselves. Watch out for that. Let's take a look at the SAM. Ah, the S-75M. Also known as, of course, you have the Volkov or the Guideline SAM, the SA-2. This is a little different. First thing you're going to notice is category. It's building revited. If it does not have a speed here, that means that particular building cannot move. Now, for example, if I were to grab myself, uh, we don't need a submarine on land. I don't know about you guys. That seems like a little silly. If we got something like a T-64, a Bulat. If we clicked on this guy, let me just bring up his database. By the way, you can have more than one database window open at a time. Isn't that awesome? Now, if you look at this one, you'll actually get data down here that should describe. Do we get it in this version, or is that something you have to get in the other one? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, bummer. But, if, of course, if you press F2, you can get its top speed that way. Anyway, ignore that. Scrolling on, you have your sensors in EW. Again, you've got all sorts of tracking information at the top. You have any types of radars. A lot of times, they'll have a Mark 1 eyeball. Then, of course, because this SAM system is basically a radar plus several missile launchers, if I actually click on mounts, oh, I'm clicking on the wrong unit. Sorry about that, everybody. Let me go ahead and click that and click that. Uh, let's go to mounts weapons. Good. You'll see that this particular unit is made up of many, 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 many units all spread out, including some jerks with the uh, man pads, which is never any fun. Of course, you got the radars, you got the missiles, and of course, if you want to kill a SAM site, you can kill these pieces independent. All these pieces, by the way, are 75 meters away from each other. Again, that's pretty much it for SAM sites. Uh, well, let's see what we have for missile defense. I've never heard of an S-75 being able to shoot down something launched at it, but you never know. There's a first time for everything. Scrolling over here, of course, we got a weird one. Underground Hardened Bunker, C3M, Command, Communications, and Control. Um, first of all, let's see, it has some size, has a note that says underground. Let's see, it's got some area here. It has a mass site, special. Hmm. You'll notice it says penetrators required. That simply means that this particular target cannot be engaged or even seen. 
unless the map editor has set this as being auto detectable. So it's actually like an invisible underground bunker. It's actually kind of neat how that works. But basically it's the same as anything else. Just very, very difficult to kill. Which is about it for facilities. Again, you're going to see things like every once in a while, like ammo dumps and stuff, but generally those properties are the same. All right, moving on. Now we have satellite. Satellites are basically flying sensor platforms. If you click on it, it's going to give you all the detail you're familiar with from before. So for example, uh, let's get something. Uh, do we have a big bird in here somewhere? Uh, there it is, big bird black flower. You can see it gives you the type. Again, different types of satellites have different properties, but if you're interested in what they are, just look at the sensors themselves. For example, this is basically the good old fashioned camera on a satellite. Basically it's the ability to see anything within 225 nautical miles slant range of itself. It gives you some general information for size, and it gives you radar signatures. You're probably sitting there going, um, why would I need to be able to target a satellite that's in the air? Well, for those of you guys who are interested, um, if you actually type in Aegis, and uh, let's see, do we have any of the good ones? Uh, these are these the ones that have anti-satellite capability? I'd have to look it up. Oh, where's Belugan when I need them? Basically, some systems actually can engage satellites, so they have to have a radar signature. But that's pretty much all there is to them. We don't have to launch the satellite, so we're not really too concerned with the rest of it. Last but not least, whew, I'm sorry, this ended up being a little longer than anticipated, but this information is usually pretty good to know. I wish I knew it when I first started this game. You have weapons. Now, there's different kinds of weapons. You have good old-fashioned things like guns. For example, 100 millimeter heat rounds. This would probably come off a tank. Notice, by the way, you can come down here and click on the unit that this particular weapon is carried by. We also have things like drop tanks. Now, this is a little annoying, because if you actually look here, it's going to say, oh, look at that, it carries some fuel. 5.1 minutes worth. Huh? I think you could do the math to figure out how many liters that this particular fuel tank is carrying and actually do the calculation for weight. I believe it's 0.87 kilograms to the liter or something along those lines for JP4. Again, I'm going to leave that for your own calculations. Just know that you're going to have things like drop tanks in here. You're also going to get stuff like this. Uh, do we have sensor pod? Yeah, here we go. A sensor pod. Check it out. So this sensor pod is actually a combination of sensors loaded into a little pod that can be mounted on this cool little Reaper UAV. You're going to see quite a bit of this. You can even type in, I think, do we have camera on this one? Yes. We have generic camera pods, of course, which can be mounted on different items. We have specific cameras. And again, the details are relatively straightforward. Where things become less straightforward is when you start looking at actual weapons. Now, for example, you'll notice this type is a gun. You'll notice it has what type of warhead. The warhead is what does the damage. This one does three damage points. For those of you guys who do division quickly, you'll realize that three damage points is going to take an awful long time to blow up that single unit airport we saw a while ago. It tells you valid targets. It also tells you things like its range. Keep in mind there's four different ranges depending on the type of weapon. The best way to look at this, let's go get a KS-19, is the fact that this weapon can be used against air targets, against surface targets, and land targets. Now a lot of you are going to be a little bummed out that this KS-19, which is a gigantic anti-aircraft gun, cannot engage targets that are greater than 1.5 nautical miles away. That's less than 10,000 feet, even though its real range would probably be 20 or 30,000 feet. It's just kind of interesting how that works. You have the percent of hit in the air. Obviously, 4% is not a terribly good chance, but if you fire enough, eventually you'll hit. Then, of course, you have your surface percent of hit, reliability, things like that. And, of course, CEP, which is simply a measure of how accurate the round is. It's within 80 meters of what you aimed at with it. It will also give you the WRA default. And, of course, you can always click on a unit if you want to see who normally gets to carry that particular weapon. So let's go to something a little bit more complicated. Let's get a torpedo. By the way, notice there's different versions of weapons. Some versions are actually named the same thing, which makes it nice and complicated, but the key elements are pretty much the same. For example, if I have my Mark 48 Mod 3, I can see it's a torpedo. It's got its general size, its weight. I have important things, such as how fast it can go up. This is an important number, by the way. If you are a submarine that's at 1,000 feet below sea level and you're shooting at a torpedo and a target directly above your head, you can't actually hit it right away because the, miss the torpedo, I should say, will basically have to keep spiraling and spiraling and spiraling and climbing to get all the way up to an altitude where it can actually engage a shallower target. It also gives you launch altitude, target altitude, gives you its general range. Torpedoes are special because they have two ranges, sometimes three. Basically, you have ultimate long range, and of course, you have faster but shorter range. You have percentage of hit, you have reliability. Basically, if the torpedo connects with the target and is not spoofed, it has a 70% chance of actually doing damage. And of course, this number can be different from subs than it can be from surface targets. You have what kind of sensors, a torpedo or a missile or anything basically can carry on, assuming it's a sensor. Keep in mind this Mark 48, as amazing as it is, look at how short the range is on the seeker. That's actually pretty impressive. It'll give you data links if they have it. For example, 
and bullet figure myself a tactical tomahawk real quick. This is a really, really neat weapon, by the way. It'll actually give you, let's see here, ah, tomahawk missile data link. So it can actually talk back to the unit that fired it, which is really, really cool. You have signatures. Keep in mind, weapons have signatures of their own. A good example. Actually, tomahawk's a good example here. You can notice that it's pretty darn small for radar. Of course, if you get something like this, watch this. Now that's what I call a small target. We finally found a cruise missile that could destroy the S-400. And that's basically going to be the same as what you're used to in the other categories. It's going to give you some propulsion. Obviously, if any weapon gets hit, it's automatically destroyed. Keep in mind, there's no damage to weapons. It's either one and done kind of a thing, or it's a weapon that can't be engaged. So, for example, if I fire a mortar shell, there's nothing that can shoot that mortar shell down. It's always going to hit its target. Cruising down here, of course, you have cruise speed. That's going to be a little different depending if, again, we'll go grab a torpedo. Scrolling down, you can see that they're different speeds because they're different uh, methods of using this particular torpedo and then of course a lot of times this is going to be confusing but for fuel type you're actually going to get a rating in minutes so for example if i get an aim 9b something a little ancient here oh it's so cute look at the little roller rounds coming down here you can see that rocket fuel is 10 seconds in this particular game this rocket fuel is how long the weapon stays in the air for those of you who are familiar with flight simulators, when you fire a missile, after the engine burns out, it just cruises. Unfortunately, we don't simulate that. We abstract that a little bit in command. As a matter of fact, if you actually scroll down here, you're going to notice for any guided missile, is it's actually going to have different performances depending on what altitude it's launched. So for example, if um, actually I'm going to get you a better one here. Let's get an AM120D. For example, an AM120D, if I launch it at an altitude of 36,000 feet, look at the speed it travels at for 105 seconds. That's amazing. Amazing. On the flip side, if I launch it at less than 12,000 feet, look at how much slower the weapon is going to be traveling because it's going to be at a lower altitude and therefore in thicker air. So for those of you guys who could do the math really, really quickly on that one, you can probably determine that this thing is probably going to have somewhere around, I don't know, about a 75 mile range-ish. If you actually go up here, you can see that, surprise, it's about a 75 nautical mile range if you fire it at a target that's at the same altitude of you and your way up. Keep in mind, some guided missiles, of course, have the ability to do lofting. Uh, I think the AIM-7, I think the new one does. Let me go take a look real quick. Is this the lofting one? Some of them will actually travel and go like this and then come back down. Uh, some of these have, let's see, target altitude. And, uh, there it is, cruise altitude. These missiles actually launch themselves upwards and then they dive down on their targets. That's what the cruise altitude is represented by. Now, another thing to notice about guided weapons too, let's go get ourselves a harpoon. We'll get a nice classic one. We'll get a, uh, let's get the end model. I always like this. As you notice, this cruise altitude is exceptionally low because of course it's an anti-ship missile. It's a sea skimmer and you'll actually see some of those details in down here, as well as the type of warheads, as well as who's going to use it, as well as what's about doing it, as well as all the units that carry it and how long it can stay in the air. So that's about it as far as the database and command goes. Again, the quickest and easiest way to use it, just click on a unit that you're interested in, click on the entry, and you're able to read it like this. I like these two web resources too, for those of you who want to go into a little more detail. And go ahead and check out that video as well, like I said, the one on RStudio, where you can actually open up that database for those of you who are a little savvy. One last thing I will leave you with is just to give you an idea of the differences in climb rates. So right now I noticed that my Tupelid 16 here has a 2180 climb rate. Looking at my F-16 AM right here, the uh, MLU version, you'll notice there's a climb rate of, ah, 32,000. So what I'm going to do is order both of these units to get to maximum altitude at Afterburner. Keep in mind, tuple of 16 can't do that, but watch this. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn this mode on so you can see it very, very clearly. I'm actually going to get rid of that, and you can watch for yourselves. Go ahead and speed up time so it's not too, too long. You can see our F-16, pause. F-16 has just crossed 10,000 feet in 23 seconds. This particular unit is at a whopping altitude of 1,565 feet. So notice, even though the F-16, quote, can climb 30,000 feet per minute, actually, we'd probably have to go a full minute, shouldn't we? Let's go a full minute just to demonstrate our point here. Do, 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 do. You'll notice that in that time, the average climb rate was just about that. And keep in mind, in this time, the average climb rate was also just about that. And again, I expect about a minute, it gained about 2,000 feet, a little less, because again, it's an average. So hopefully this video was helpful. Again, it's usually not a topic people associate with this program, but for those of you guys who are looking to buy this, again, it's one of the coolest things. I have a good collection of Jane's books I've collected over the years, but they're practically moot given how much detail is inside this uh, particular program. Enjoy!